Hello, hello, hello. Welcome back to Toy Thursday with Johnny Tiger on July 15, 2021. Quick report after getting my second shot yesterday. My arm is a little bit sore today, but uh, other than that, there's no adverse effect. Uh, everything's good so far. So far, so good. That's good. Um, and again, quick reminder due to some reason uh, recently. Uh, YouTube app changes. Uh, I am, for some reason, unable to record video using the YouTube app. So I'm trying out a new app, a new setup. As you guys can see, the countertop. The we are uh, doing a completely different angle today. Uh, so all this is to say that I have no idea if this is working out or not. Uh, if you guys don't tell me, uh, don't register any complaint, then I'm just going to continue to do it this way. Now, if you guys find it hard to watch or there's uh, something the matter with the camera or uh, anything like that, please bring it up in the comment section. Because the only way for me to know to improve is if you guys tell me what's wrong with the video. Okay, so with that said, uh, I want to thank everyone that have commented and enjoyed our daily video. It's been a very interesting year with the pandemic and all this stuff. I have done my best bringing you fresh new content every year. Uh, and I will try to do so for as long as possible. So, uh, this past two weeks, we have talked about some of the forefathers of my favorite genre of novels, which is fantasy. The fantasy novels uh, are split into several different categories. There's the epic fantasy, uh, there's the high fantasy, and uh, there's urban fantasy, and so on and so on. And of all those fantasy uh, categories, all the different kinds of fantasies, my favorite has always been swords and sorcery. Now, a lot of people was asked, uh, well, what is swords and sorcery other than it has swords and it has magic? Uh, so, uh, does that qualify as Harry Potter? Does qual Harry Potter qualify as swords and sorcery? Because, you know, there's magic and there's definitely a sword in there. Uh, and Lord of the Rings, does that qu qualify as swords and sorcery? Uh, well, for the most part, a Lord of the Ring qualifies as epic fantasy and Harry Potter would be what we would say young adult fantasy. Neither of them, uh, to me at least, some people may have a different opinion, uh, some people may have, uh, have, have a different explanation of what swords and sorcery, but my understanding of swords and sorcery, of real swords and sorcery, is that it has to follow a very specific pattern. Uh, swords and sorcery novels usually are very light-hearted. That they are not uh, this world-building massive. Uh, we've got to invent uh, ten different new races and ten different new languages and uh, write an entire history. Uh, swords and sorcery don't usually focus on that. Although there's definitely an element of world-building because you need to build a believable world for your readers to be able to uh, follow the characters, to get into the characters. But swords and sorcery, for the most part, focus on the adventure itself. And uh, for the most part, there's more than one adventure. A lot of real sword and sorcery books, such as The Forgotten Realms and uh, Our Subject of the Night, Conan the Barbarian, etc., uh, etc., et these swords and sorcery classics, they have no beginning and no end. Uh, so you're introduced to a hero, and the hero is already a well-developed warrior. Uh, throughout the adventure, he might drop hints about his childhood, he, uh, uh, his uh, parentage, and stuff like that. But for the most part, uh, swords and sorcery don't require a beginning, and they don't require an end. Swords and sorcery books uh, usually have many, many episodes. They are uh, different adventures by the same character and through time you grow to love that character and grow to look forward to his or her next adventure. 
kind of like the old Thundercat uh, episodial cartoon, the old T-Man and the Masters of the Universe, where the hero is basically going on different adventures every episode. Uh, today, the hero may be in Samaria fighting off an evil dictator, and tomorrow, his journey to the pirate kingdom of Navaria, and uh, I'm making these up, by the way, uh, and, and he's uh, you know, free the, freeing the enslaved people there, and then the day after, he has to go slay a dragon to rescue a beautiful princess. Swords and sorcery books, just, uh, it's very light, very uh, fun, and uh, just tend to go on and on like that. There's always another adventure in another book. I love Swords and Sorcery because for me, when I'm reading, I mostly want to read for enjoyment. I don't want to read and feel like I need to remember a thousand different traditions and different names and different magical spells and different uh, rulers and queens and their political intrigues and stuff like that. I, I, when I'm reading, I mean, I, uh, once in a while, I enjoy a good high epic fantasy, but for the most part, I just want to relax and read a good story where the hero is going to go fight the evil uh, demon and then in the end the hero rides away with a pouch full of gold and another good victory behind him. I want simple stories like that. Maybe that makes me a shallow person, I don't know, but hey, that's just the way it is. Arguably, when we talk about swords and sorcery in modern era, there is one person who is said to be the father of modern sword and sorcery book. In 1932, an author by the name of Robert E. Howard was looking at some dis distant hill in the misty rain in Texas, United States. And just as he was standing there looking at the distant hill, a land and a character germinated in his mind and grew bigger in the next nine months. He started writing the adventure of Conan the Barbarian. Conan the Barbarian is this young warrior who hailed from a northern land called Sumeria. He is, well, he's a barbarian. He has blue eyes and black hair. He is immensely tall and powerful. It's one of the strongest people in his world, and he has uh, many, many things that he has done. He wandered around, traveled from land to land, sometimes he, uh, is working as a thief, sometimes working as a mercenary, sometimes working as a hero, sometimes working uh, as uh, one of the soldiers fighting in some uh, civil war. But no matter what he does, Conan always has his trusty sword at his side and his immense power, uh, mighty arms, and his ability to charm women all around him and drink, uh, out drink almost anybody in his vicinity. Uh, in addition to that, he is very quick, very strong, uh, quite smart, and a lot of times he's able to uh, defeat or kill even people with magic because he's able to uh, use his brain rather than just rely on his brawn all the time. Conan is the first sword and sorcery hero in modern time. It was very sad when in 1936 uh, Robert E. Howard took his own life and ended the short run a short success and he's Conan the Barbarian. I'm not going to stand here and go into all the details about uh, the circumstances around his suicide, but uh, I will promise you it's quite an interesting although very sad read. If you guys are interested, just go on Google and look up Wikipedia entry on Robert E. Howard. Uh, he had a very tragic end. But I want this episode to celebrate Conan rather than to grieve for Robert E. Howard. Little did Robert E. Howard know when he died, little did he know that Conan did not die with him. In his belongings, 
His agent found some unpublished Conan story, and for the next ten, twenty years, through all through the 1950s and 40s,、uh, his agent went on and published these unpublished stories of Conan that Howard never did get around to finishing and publishing. And Conan remained a smashing success even into the 70s when. Uh, Marvel Comics. That's the home to Spider-Man and Captain America. By the way, Marvel Comics、uh, started publishing comic books based on Conan the Barbarian, called the Savage Sword of Conan. And some of you may remember, in 1982, Arnold Schwarzenegger、uh, starred in、uh, the Conan movie. And I think for a lot of people, a lot of people my generation. Uh, that their first exposure to Conan the Barbarian. Conan the Barbarian has also been、uh, taken over by many other famous authors, including Paul Anderson and the now also deceased Robert Jordan, who wrote The Wheel of Time. Personally, I always found Robert Jordan's Conan stories were my favorite. I I know that's almost sacrilege, as a lot of people say. How can you say that?、Uh, you should. Say the original Robert E. Howard was the best, but really, like、uh, this is just my opinion. But Robert E. Howard's writing style, although very、uh, good for his time, he was very abrupt. A lot of stuff was left、uh, will leave you guessing. There's not a lot of fine details in his books. A lot of it leave left out to your imagination. Uh, while that's good for some people,、uh, sometimes I do find that is a little bit too much、uh, guessing for me. I prefer Robert Jordan's Conan book because his Conan stay true to Robert E. Howard's characterization, while、uh, flushing them up with way more details and uh, way more uh, uh, complex adventures, shall we say? But again, that's just my opinion.、Uh, if you、uh, like Howard's style better than Jordan's, that's totally up to you.、Uh, that's the beauty of reading books. Everyone has their own take. So let's get to Conan. We are going to showcase some action figures based on this first and foremost、uh, hero of the sword and sorcery genre for the modern time. First, in front of the camera, you've been. Uh, looking at it for the last ten、uh, minutes、uh, with this preamble, it's a two-piece set, a diorama made by Todd McFarlane. On the right, yes, this big monster ape thing that a lot of you might remember. I've shown in the monkey、uh, in, in the monkey episode. This is the Hunter of the Pit, and on the left, we have. Conan the Barbarian leaping into the air, coming down with his sword in his left hand and his、uh, battle axe in his right hand, and just ready to strike the beast down from above. This diorama was made by Todd McFarlane, I believe, in 2003, and while it has a lot of faults to itself,、uh, which we'll go into that briefly.、Uh, It is a beautiful, beautiful set,、uh, and takes one of the more memorable scene out of the original、uh, Hour of the Dragon Conan book by Robert E. Howard, when、uh, after being captured by the evil sorcerer Zaltaton, Conan was thrown into a dungeon, and while in there, Conan was freed by a slave girl called、uh, Zenobia, who. Later became Conan's queen after Conan reclaimed his uh, throne. Uh, now, uh, like I said, this took place in the Hour of the Dragon, and this was an older Conan the Barbarian. This is what after uh, he uh, slew the king of Ecrolona and、uh, took the throne for himself, and he became King Conan, and then he got、uh, deposed by the evil sorcerer. And thrown into the dungeon. So, long story short, after Zenobia, the slave girl, freed Conan from the dungeon, she told him that 
the only way out was through the pit. Uh, the pit was this evil place underneath and behind the dungeon where uh, the sorcerer kept a lot of crazy monsters and uh, he would uh, uh, throw people in there to battle the monsters and get eaten like a gladiatorial uh, pit. And the most fiercest creature in the pit was these giant apes that would eat people. And they were strong, they were savage, and they were uh, uh, very difficult to defeat, especially if you uh, are armed with nothing but your bare hands. Uh, luckily for Conan, uh, Zenobia also provided him with a uh, uh, stolen weapon, axe and sword. Uh, so when he went into the pit and ran into the haunter of the pit, this giant ape, he wasn't so defenseless. And in the end, he was able to defeat the giant ape and escape from the dungeon. This diorama uh, recreates that moment when Conan, leaping down from above uh, to uh, attack the haunter of the pit, this giant ape. Uh, we can see that uh, the ape is really big. Uh, let me bring her. Uh, I used to say it's he, but it's actually a she. I can't remember where I read it, but it's actually a she. Uh, let me bring her here, and hopefully you guys can see her in my hand. She's a hefty figure with giant tusks coming out of her mouth, and uh, her arm is reaching out like she's trying to grasp Conan. If I put her back on her base, there we go. If I put her back on her base, you can see that the arm lines up with Conan pretty well. It's like Conan jump, jumping in the air, coming down, and the ape is reaching to grab him and then, uh, wanting to snatch him out of the air and then uh, start eating him. Okay? But of course, Conan is not going to let that happen. So let's look at Conan. This is uh, Conan trying to escape from the dungeon, so he's wearing very little. But this is probably the closest to most of our idea, most people's idea of Conan, wearing nothing but boots, loincloth, and a lot of muscles. Just look at the muscles on his back. This guy is so ripped, it's ridiculous. Like, if I, if I run a, a contest of the most muscular action figure in my collection, this guy would probably be up there. At the, at, if not the first, he would be one of the top three. He is ridiculously muscular. Um, he has long, shaggy hair, a sword in one hand, an axe in the other hand. Very good looking uh, set of figures. However, they are plagued by a lot of problems. Uh, one, yes, what you see is what you get. You're not going to be able to change their pose. Conan is forever leaping down from above because he's supported on this steel rod with his legs curled in and his arm raised above his head like that. He's, he's forever stuck in that pose. You, you can't change his pose, okay? That's a, <laughs> what you see is what you get. And the hunter of the pit, same thing. He's for, uh, she's forever having her arm raised like that, and uh, she's down in a crouch. Uh, her, you can turn her waist a little bit, and her left arm can kind of turn in and out slightly. But there's not much you can do with them. They're not much, really. That like these are not action figures. These are at the best statues. Another problem is. When they were sold, these two were sold separately. You look at them, you know they belong together. They, they, you, you can't have one without the other. Right? If you have Conan just on his own on the shelf without the hunter of the pit, he looks silly. He's just hovering in midair. Right? If you have the hunter of the pit on the shelf without Conan, well, then she kind of looks weird too because she's reaching for something that's not there. So, this two 
they belong in a set. They have to go together. You, you can't display, display them separately. So it's very baffling then that McFarlane would sell them separately rather than in a set. Uh, to me, that, that's really weird planning right there. Now, the lack of articulation is just a big thing for Todd McFarlane back then, uh, in the early 2000s. So, I don't want to keep harping on that, but suffice to say, the next two figures I'm going to show you have exactly the same problem. Now, to be fair, every one of us who collected McFarlane's action figures knew about these problems. Every one of us knew about this problem. We still kept buying the action figures. So this shows how much we enjoy, uh, how well sculpted, how nice looking these figures were, and how we were able to uh, overlook these shortcomings. So uh, there's really no point keep harping on a problem that those of us who collected McFarlane figures already knew about. Uh, you buy a McFarlane figure, you knew uh, that articulation is not going to be a thing. Uh, however, uh, this set of this Conan also has an additional problem that is common at the time. His sword is stuck in his hand. Right, the axe you can take it out of his hand, no problem. But the sword, it's stuck in there. You can kind of rotate it, but there's no way to get it out. That it, it's just uh, forever in, in there. Now, granted, you probably won't display him without his sword. That would be unfair to him. He does have to fight a giant ape. By the way, I, I believe in the actual story, in the actual story, I believe he ended up killing the giant ape with a dagger rather than an axe or a sword. But it's been a long time since I read Hour of the Dragon, so I may be mistaken about that. Taking this unhappy uh, duo off the table, putting them aside, we are going to move on to our next Conan the Barbarian action figure. Here is another depiction of Conan the Barbarian, also by Todd McFarlane. Now normally, I do not buy multiple action figures depicting the same character. Uh, normally, I like to just have one depiction of a character unless uh, it's something really different. And as you can see, this version of Conan looks very different from the previous one I showed. The previous one uh, was the, your typical barbarian, just wearing loincloth and shoe and boots, while this one is actually uh, Conan in proper clothes. Now, despite of what we see in the 1982 movie where Schwarzenegger as Conan just run around bare chested and uh, with a lot of, uh, with very little clothes for the most part, uh, that was not the intention of Robert E. Howard when he wrote Conan because it doesn't make sense. Yeah, like, it doesn't matter what kind of big muscles you have. It doesn't matter what kind of barbarian you have. You you just don't ride into battle wearing just your loincloth. You know, like that doesn't make sense at all. So, once uh, uh, Howard uh, once said that his idea of Conan is Conan would wear whatever attire was appropriate for for whatever he's trying to do at the time. So this action figure of Conan we have here. He has Conan in his battle gear. This is him uh, properly dressed for battle rather than trying to escape from a dungeon. So Conan here is wearing a very uh, heavy looking cloak on his back. Uh, What's kind of a, I don't know if that's a wolf pelt or bear pelt design. Definitely looks like it can be really warm in the cold, uh, when the weather gets cold. And he's wearing uh, a very detailed scale mail chest plate. Yeah, so we have we, we are not seeing all those muscles I'm showing here. 
and he got a horn helmet on his head. This is why I bought this one because this is, in my mind, a more sensible Conan that can stand alongside my other fantasy warriors on the shelf. Uh, and that uh, dungeon uh, half naked Conan have to be displayed pretty much on his own because he just doesn't display well with other people. This Conan is also in a more neutral pose. I mean, he's still kind of stuck in this half crouched uh, wide leg stance, but at least when you have him on the shelf, he doesn't look too out of place. He's always looking to the side, unfortunately. Like I said, a lot of these are more statue than action figure, but you can get some wiggle out of his arm. Again, he has a axe in one hand, in his left hand, he has an axe. In his right hand, he has a broadsword that he's pulling from the sheath at his belt. And his uh, display face just fell off. Anyway, uh, yeah, so we can think of this Conan as a uh, properly dressed, battle ready Conan, while the other one would be called the Dungeon Escape Conan, where he's uh, almost naked. Moving on, now that we've seen two versions of Conan, it's time to introduce Conan's friend. This very impressive looking warrior. Now, most people, unless you uh, were, oh, it just fell over. Uh, unless you were up to date with your uh, McFarlane, Todd McFarlane, uh, made believe biography, um, you wouldn't know who this guy is. But if I mention his name, those of you who read the original Conan stories would know who I'm talking about. <clears throat> this guy is supposed to be Palantiri, or Palantai, Palantiri. I'm not quite sure uh, how it's supposed to be pronounced. I think it's Palantiri, uh, because it has a kind of a Greek pronunciation to it. So Palantiri uh, is uh, when Conan was King Conan, when Conan sat on the throne, obviously, excuse me one second. <coughs> <coughs> A lot of talking, dry throat. Uh, when Conan was King Conan, sitting on the throne, ruling a country, obviously Conan couldn't be out there getting into battles all the time. Yet now he's a king. He has to do a lot of uh, politics stuff. So he had to rely on his soldiers to fight a lot of battles for him. His most trusted uh, military general was Palantiri, a man uh, in his 60s who was still one of the finest warriors around, and who had a very good mind for tactics and politics. Now, those of you who read the original story and you, you are thinking about Palantiri, you are probably thinking, that is not what I imagined Palantiri would look like. And you're not wrong. Like, uh, my idea of the old a uh, military general was maybe a tall but uh, more uh, slender figure because in the story Polentity never seemed to be very heroic. In the story Polentity never seemed to uh, be very uh, strong or uh, muscular or anything like that. In the story he's just like the guy who always trying to talk some sense into Conan and he would lead Conan's army and stuff like that. But honestly, we have never seen any heroic act or mighty display of uh, strength from Palantiri. But if you look at this action figure, uh, drum, dreamed out by the mind of Todd McFarlane, this is a mighty warrior. Palantiri here is depicted uh, looking to the side. He's looking over his left shoulder while his, le uh, his left hand is reaching across his body to draw his sword. 
On his right shoulder, he has a beautiful shield clipped to his arm, and he's also wearing a very fine cloak. Is that a cape or cloak? I think it's called a cape when it's like that.、Uh, on his back. Now, if I lift up his cape, you can see this guy's sporting some serious muscles. But look at the muscles on his back and his arm. This is one husky、uh, warrior. I mean, let me bring Conan back into the frame, and then we can really get an idea of how big Tolentini is here. This is Conan. Next to Polentity, and you can see that Polentity looks bigger than Conan. What a fine pair of、uh, brave-looking warriors they make! So, I mean, I, I I'll never complain about having a strong warrior, strong-looking armored warrior on my shelf, ah,、uh, but. This this super muscular dude in、uh, military armor is not my、uh, idea. Is not what I imagined Polentity would be from the books. And just like Conan, Polentity has the same problem. He you can't do much with him. You just take him out of the package and put him on the shelf, and that's it. He's forever looking over his shoulder. He's forever reaching across his body to draw his sword. You can't change his pose at all, so this he's really just a statue. However, he、uh, is he is sporting some really fine-looking armor. I mean, just look at look at the crest on that helmet. That's some that that crest gave him at least another inch of height. That uh, so, uh, very Roman centurion-looking helmet. But like I said, those of us who bought him or bought McFarlane figures back then, we knew what kind of problem we were going to run into. We're essentially just getting statues, so、uh, there's no point dwelling on that. Now let me just show you another part of him that's super muscular. I don't know if you guys can see it, but look at his thigh. Look at the legs there. Wow, that is some beefy, beefy legs. Fortunately, there was another company that made、uh, Conan action figures the right way with articulation and everything. But unfortunately, they only made two, and they didn't make it anymore. They made a Conan. Of course, if you want to make a, if you want to, you want to make Conan action figure, you have to make the main character himself.、Uh, I did not get Conan、uh, because, like I said, I don't like multiple. Versions of the same character, unless they are really, really different. So I already have a half-naked Conan. I already have a battle armor Conan. That's enough for me. So I did not pick up the Conan released、uh, back in around 2008 by Marvel Toys. However, I did get their other figure for Conan, which was one of Conan's chief nemesis, the guy. By the name of Rao. Who is Rao? Rao is a demon lord from another world. He rides a scout, a a a a, a carnivorous horse with bat's wings, and he is a master swordsman, and he can eat people's soul. Rao's mission in life is to conquer. As many worlds as he can, and eat as many souls as he can, and that's how he end up coming to conflict with Conan the Barbarian. Rao is one of those very, very few enemies that Conan just can't、uh, overcome with his sheer strength alone, because Rao is bigger and stronger because he's a demon, and he, at the same time he also. Has a lot of dark magic at his disposal.、Uh, Rao is a crazy, crazy、uh, demonic entity、uh, that 
he, in addition to being super powerful, super strong, and a good swordsman,、uh, Rao also was、uh, very very smart and could usually scheme and plot his way into、uh, ruining any kingdom he set his eyes on. He was so treacherous that he even seduced a human woman, and once she fathered. Uh, once he fathered his own child in her, he used that child as his reincarnation. So when he died, he came back in the body of that child. I mean, that that's just like all kind of wrong in so many levels, right? Now, so here we have Rao, a very impressive looking、uh, demon figure from Marvel Toys. Rao is wearing blue and black armor. He has armored boots and armored Gauntlet on his hand. He's wearing a big, impressive-looking horned helmet and a tattered cape on his back. And he is very muscular. He is a、uh, uh, he he quite an impressive-looking、uh, character.、Uh, he also has a problem standing. This is why he's tipping back and forth like that. Uh, because his joints are a little bit loose. You see, this is a problem when you have action figures that have joints. When you have action figures that don't have joints, you don't have to worry about things coming loose after a while. And when you have action figures that have too many joints, eventually these joints loosen up and you can barely get them to stand anymore. So、uh, Rao here has that problem. He he's an old figure, so his joints are kind of loose. If we take off his helmet, you can see that Rao has a disgusting-looking head. He has red eyes and red mouth, and his head looks like a, a rotting, decaying purple mess that、uh, with a decaying flesh covering his skull. That's one disgusting-looking demon. So yeah, keep keep your helmet on. Look better that way. Now, don't scare children. On his belt, he carries his demonic sword right here. With I'm guessing this is too little, too small to see, but the hilt of the sword is intertwined in serpents.、Uh, really, really cool. And he also has this little man purse on his chest. I carry one of these.、Uh, so this、uh, he carries this. Now that his soul pouch. And there's this little worm that you can take out of the pouch. What is that? That is what Rao eats. Okay, when Rao rips the soul out of a person, he transforms that soul into a slug, and then he eats it and gain、uh, power whenever he eats a soul. How creepy is that? Now, in in the uh. In the comic book, Rao is usually depicted to be、uh, ten feet tall. So this action figure does have a problem of being too short. He's only、uh, seven feet,、uh, seven inches tall,、uh, eight inches if you count his helmet. He got those giant, giant horns on his head, give him another inch of height. But he is definitely too short.、Uh, however. Being a demon, Rao quite often would disguise himself as a human. So maybe this is one of those occasions where he's、uh, going down to、um, human size. I mean, you know, if you're a ten foot tall demon, it's got to be kind of difficult walking around without drawing notice, right? But he's still pretty big.、Uh, let's bring Conan back in again, and we'll see a comparison between Conan and Rao, and we'll see. Uh, how this works? So here is Conan、uh, standing next to Rao,、uh, the Demon Lord, and as we can see,、uh, physically, they're roughly the same bulk, but Rao is almost a full head taller. So even though he's too small, he still looks fine、uh, battling Conan on the shelf. And that, my friend, concludes our.
quick look at uh, another legend in the swords and sorcery fantasy genre, the forefather, the pioneer of modern swords and sorcery, Robert E. Howard and his creation, Conan the Barbarian, uh, which actually outlived him and is still immensely popular even today. Uh, if you have not seen it, there was a Conan Barbarian uh, TV series back in the 90s called Conan the Adventurer. It was a little bit more children friendly, but very enjoyable to watch. So look it out sometime if you have not seen it. Thank you, and I'll be back again tomorrow for Fitness Friday.